Yes, I can see. Okay, uh, let's start uh, the session number two. Please sit down, uh, so we have to keep in the time schedule. So welcome to the session number two. And the title of the session is Russian Narratives and Motives. So my name is Colonel Akimauri Huhtinen, and I come from National Defense University. So my background, I have been almost 20 years the professor, military professor of the military leadership. And the first speakers, we have uh, Katri Pynaniemi and Kati Parpei. So they present the paper titled Understanding Russian War Against Ukraine, Politics, Eschatological uh, Catalysis Dimension. So please, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here in, in this panel. Uh, we have worked with this uh, uh, article now for two years, and I'm very happy to share this space with uh, uh, Kati Parpei, docent of Russian history from the University of Eastern Finland, who has written extensively on Russian uh, enemy, enemy perceptions in historical times and contemporary. So as I mentioned, we started right after the large-scale invasion to uh, study and analyze Russian military periodicals. And first version of this article was finished in December 20, uh, published in December 2022. And this is in a way uh, a version that includes uh, analytical framework for, for this uh, interpretation. And, now I try to, yes, okay, no, maybe I have to change the, oh damn, it changes at the themes, but not here, so how to do that, I really hate these technical things, no, I don't know. Sorry for this. Let's say If I uh okay. Oh no. Looks that way, okay. Yeah, yes, it's uh yeah. Yeah. And Mr. Mapine. 
lost. Okay, thank you. Sorry, sorry again. Always this happens. So, so we are um, we are using a framework developed uh, by Anatol Rapoport in his introduction to Clausewitz uh, on war that you can kind of present criticism for, for this, but we, uh, after reading for one year these same articles, and then uh, we decided that this is actually helpful to try to structure the Russian uh, discussion about what type of war they are in, in against Ukraine. So first one is very uh, well-known classical uh, understanding of war as a game and as a rational instrument of national policy. The eschatological dimension or type of war uh, sees it as a mission to change the world or at a, as a historical destiny of the country. And we have many examples from history where, where countries have launched wars or were conducting wars on, on, on this type. And then the cataclysmic one is uh, especially developed uh, uh, with emphasis on understanding the sort of peace movement and the, the kind of movements of, uh, that, that sees the war as something, uh, not focusing in a way who uh, starts the war or what are the political gains or political games involved, but rather seeing it as, as a catastrophe that uh, has affecting everybody. So war as a disaster that should, we should kind of be, try to uh, not, not to go into. So this is very briefly, and we can have a discussion later on, on the uh, analytical concepts, but uh, we try to show you today how, how we think that it, it works and helps in explaining uh, Russian discussion and thinking about this particular war. So next uh, we will uh, uh, introduce our uh, literature and, and Kati will start, start from there. Okay, so uh, my research material consists of the text published by the Russian Society of Military History. You may have heard about the society before. It was founded in 2012 and the chairman at the moment is Vladimir Medinsky. So it, it's quite obvious that the society is very close to the kernel of the power, close to the Kremlin. And they have lots of activities, the society, they erect monuments and publish different, different kind of publications and kind of support patriotic education in Russia. Actually, that's their main task as, as defined by the society. And they also maintain um, kind of history portal in the internet. And on, a, on that portal, very diverse material is published. And uh, there was a tag special military operation in Ukraine uh, that emerged at the beginning of, of the operation, uh, basically in March 2022. And there were a number of blog type texts published under that tag. But the number of those kind of texts kind of increased during the following year. But there, then there was uh, this kind of, uh, how to say, it's, it's like a journal, web journal, called um, Ideology of the Future, or for the Future. And it consists of articles which are imitating this academic style. The authors are allegedly academic experts, they are historians and so forth, so forth, military scientists. And allegedly they have academic affiliation. So, so the image that this web journal wants to give is like a very academic contribution to the discussion. And the research material for this article consists of 19 uh, texts, 19 articles, which were published um, during the, uh, 2022 and 23. And in those articles, the nature of war or special military operation is discussed and somehow pondered upon. Uh, but one more thing I would like to add is that the red thread in all the material published by the society is kind of, uh, it echoes, it, it consolidates, it constructs this pseudo-historical foundation for, 
for Russia's political and military claims and aims. So everything they publish is somehow related to that, that uh, kind of um, pseudo-historical basis. And for a historian who studies abuse of history, that kind of that material just keeps on giving <laughs> in a way. So please, Katri. Yes, uh, I briefly present uh, what what I did uh, as a uh, uh, literature for for the analysis. Uh, we choose one one of the major journals, uh, Journal of the Academy of Military Sciences, formerly headed by uh, Mahmoud Kareyev, and uh, we see there a certain uh, change in in emphasis. So on the first year of invasion, there were three roundtable sessions dedicated on the question, and uh, on on last year only one that was also focusing more on the global global effects. And what should be also mentioned here that we, uh, I only looked the geopolitical and military arts sections. You know that there are usually four different sections in each of these journals was published. So we uh, didn't look into opera operational or tactical level discussion, but re really wanted to see the the political framework or context and how it is how it is explained, and there, there as as the as it says, uh, the focus was very much on the 2022 rather than an, and less focus on 2023. Okay, and then uh, then we present you the three dimensions. And I'll start with this uh, political dimension. So there, uh, the idea is that the, the war as such is a, is a game uh, played by the nation states. And the, what is at the game is the geopolitical interest, so global constellation of power. And the way this kind of uh, understanding of war is used in, in this context is really to create the uh, legitimation for the war and consolidate the already existing, as was nicely uh, described by mm, Dimitri Minik, the, the consolidating the perception of the hostile strategic environment. So the meaning of this, this uh, type of discussion is to, in a way, continue to uh, explain why this war with the reference to uh, what Kati already referred, kind of uh, implausible or fictional understanding of the strategic environment. And also what, what this makes, what is the instrument or the why this type of uh, framings uh, are used, and it goes through all these, uh, all these articles, is to put the blame on war to the West. So uh, it is clearly presented by the authors that that West is actually the actor who is fully responsible for for the escalation. And, and there you have the uh, kind of assumption of the uh, world order in, in, in such that there, this multipolar world, its emergence is in inevitable. This was the argument made by Putin in 2007 and then it follows from there that West tries to prevent this what is inevitable. So the whole point of, of this type of discussion is in a way to prove that Russia has been right all, all, all along. And it kind of prevents uh, from seeing the actual intentions and the dynamism in, in the world. And then what is also important and what is very uh, what we know uh, historically has been the case many other types in Russian uh, strategic thinking is the idea that Russia is not uh, uh, acting first, but it is drawn into conflict. It is forced to react, this kind of idea of provocation, of which Ukraine has been created into by the West. So the idea that uh, Ukraine is not really the agent in the, in the game, but rather a proxy of the Western interest. Um, 
and it's very very clearly stated in this in this uh, discussion. And then lastly, there is this kind of sense. It's not very often. It's not the main threat of the discussion, but some authors. Uh, go beyond and, and, and kind of consider that uh, of the escalation of this uh, hybrid, mostly considered as hybrid attacks against uh, Russia, uh, developing into an aggressive war. So this is the perception that is uh, considered uh, in, in the discussion. But then uh, let's look at the next dimension. Yes. Uh Maybe we could say that this political dimension, it's like more rational, maybe it's uh, aimed for more like external audience. But this eschatological uh, dimension is definitely meant to resonate in Russian audience. It's, at, least, at least that's my opinion. And this eschatological aspect is, is the one which is especially strongly emphasized in the text published by the by the Society of Military History. And of course, it's intertwined with the next one, with the cataclysmic dimension. Actually, all these dimensions are, of course, like intertwined, overlapping. And according to this, uh, this type of justification, the main aim is to uh, create or recreate the Russian world, which means basically reuniting Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus into common civilizational entity, with, with, which has this very strong historical or pseudo-historical justification, of course. And Ukraine is once again represented as having been manipulated by the West to become like anti-Russia. It's represented like being tricked into believing in European individualistic liberal values. Liberal fascism is the concept used in these texts. And it's been tricked into believing into this false democracy instead of traditional good values represented by, by Russia. And in a way, in this kind of thinking, Russia is represented as saving Ukraine and saving herself at the same time by halting this expansion of, of this destructive and, and kind of uh, corruptive Western influence. And it's interesting that in these uh, texts published by these so-called academic uh, experts, uh, the academic rhetoric actually occasionally changed into something religious and even fundamentalist. Uh, they're talking about holy war, for instance. So, so there is this kind of dimension which is religious and kind of reaching towards this uh, religious rhetoric. So the first one, the military political sort of classical Clausewitzian model does recognize uh, and, and claims that there was a uh, um, military threat to, to Russia that it kind of actively uh, acted on. And the meaning for this is the, the overall geopolitical struggle between Russia and the West. And then it ends up with the idea of elimination of the military threat, again, something very, very classical uh, explanation there, that then should result, as it is explained, into an increase in uh, Russia's geopolitical power. This is understood in terms of sphere of, 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 um, sphere of interest. Where, which is in directly uh, in conflict with the other explanatory model that comes from this eschatological cataclysmic dimension of understanding the war, where Russia is viewed as, as a victim of uh, Western aggression for centuries or since uh, 2014. And what is at stake is the survival of, of the Russian state civilization. And what is required is then the creation of the Russian world in Ukraine, the kind of said that uh, every Ukrainian should somehow find their the Russian roots. So what it means basically is that uh, it's in a way this very fan fantastic uh, analysis that we are presenting, it ends with the same message to, to Ukraine and to the West that uh, Russia is uh, aiming for complete destruction of, 
Ukraine, basically, comp complete ca capitulation. And what Dimitri Minik mentioned in, in the keynote session, I think, is, is relevant, the idea of eight phases of, of the war. So, so this is the kind of very, uh, very sad conclusion that we can draw from, from, this, uh, from this literature. But uh, I would like to uh, end by uh, offering two interpretations. So what is the meaning of this, of this our analysis? Uh, because we wouldn't like to uh, repeat uh, the Russian um, arguments uh, without uh, taking a step back. So first of all, uh, I think uh, we are dealing with the phenomenon of strategic deception. So these writings are part of the operational and, uh, and the kind of long-term strategic um, narrative building that now uh, is very much also present in the academic world. So academic world, the media, the, the Kremlin are all part of the same, same game here. And then what we witness is the emergence of this totalitarian discourse where academic writing also has to go with a certain, certain line. And what is the role of this academic discussion is to consolidate the public perception of the meaning of war according to this Kremlin view. That was very clear with the first, first year. Now the emphasis is in, in other, uh, other issues. And, and not to un underestimate the effect of demonization of Ukraine for the ability for, of Russia to continue this war. And then the second one is uh, that we can also uh, use this uh, analysis and read these articles with the sense that uh, they do reflect core assumptions about the nature of war or type of war. So um, it's not just a <coughs> deception kind of game, but uh, we can instill some, some ideas there. And um, I, we, we here at the, at the moment uh, emphasize two points. Uh, the first one that hasn't changed is to s not to see Ukraine as an independent actor that has then uh, uh, influence on way to complete this uh, war or to have the negotiations. And, and then the other one that I already mentioned, the expectation of, of complete capitulation that is also important in sense of the political dimension. But I'm sure that you in the audience can, can imagine all, also other, other ways to interpret this work and I'm looking forward for, for discussion on, on that that side. So thank you from, from our part now and uh, um, let's continue. Thank you, Brian and, and we have a couple of minutes time to, to, to question or comments. Thank you very much. It was very interesting uh, to listen to that and actually this uh, your research supports so supports my mind very much and my question is related to the recent interview Putin gave to, to the American journalist. According to your feelings, what method uh, this interview was based on? Political, military or this fancy uh, words based the second one? I came up with my conclusion, I just want to be sure that my conclusion at least is not mistaken. I think it was clearly aimed at this political dimension that Russia has the right and Russia has been mistreated politically for decades and actually for centuries even. So I think it, it was quite clear that it wasn't aimed at Russians. But so it was don't you think that actually he was speaking based on the military research? He was speaking as the military idea represented, not as a politician. Mm -hmm. Carlos, you were first, then uh, there, and Sinikuka, yes. Yeah, the, the speaking about the eschatological and cataclysmic, sometimes I, I see even a kind of apocalyptic, you know, and, and my concern this match with the potential use of 
nuclear weapons. I think that there is a part also in, in the rhetoric. But my question is that, you see, like in the Bible, that there is a part, like a, the return of, of the prodigal son, you know, when we speak about Ukraine. Is, is it still a possibility, you know, like in the Bible, that this prodigal son could return home after? First, maybe for the Ukrainians there was some possibilities to reintegrate and so on, but I think that the, the discourse now is, is very taxative for that. You know. So I, I would like to know your perception on that. Mm. Well, actually that's very interesting, like, uh, reference. I haven't been reading really those, uh, uh, like, speeches of, like, for, for instance, Patriarch Kirill, but I might imagine that this this reference to the prodigal son has been used at some point, but I haven't seen it. But it's it might well be there because uh, yeah, because there's this long tradition of biblical references in in Russian national narratives. Of course, not during the Soviet times, but before that. So that's a very interesting point. Just an, another observation. There were several references in the literature to, to former Ukraine, so mm. denying, in a way, existence of sovereignty. And that's been also the, the part of the official language for a long time, that uh, they are not, in a way, dealing with, the, in that sense, uh, with the political uh, warfare. Uh, uh, classical uh, traditional warfare, but with regions, and this actually is something written in Elin uh, in, in about Ukraine in the 1950s. So again, big uh, deep roots with uh, with the denial of Ukraine a a sovereignty, which is crucial. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. I've got two brief questions. Uh, first, on the eschatological perspective, you mentioned there's a sort of religious rhetoric. Um, to me, it also sounds very Marxist. Is, is that, um, is that o overt Marxism or maybe an implied Marxism? Do they, do they actually quote Marx in, in any of this rhetoric or is it maybe, maybe implied? And then the second question is for the cataclysmic uh, perspective. You, you, you highlighted that. The West is identified as, as Nazi. Do you think that the West's failure to um, define itself and to be able to defend or provide an, an articulation of who we are is what's opening the door for Russia to identify us? Um, uh, that does, that's it. Okay, um, I also I, I didn't maybe think uh, on that sense, but I, I agr agree that this idea of Marxist underlying tone I is definitely there and uh, something that we should look upon in, in more like in a structure of the assumptions and uh, way of argumenting maybe rather than of course in a actual content, but. Uh, you would probably like to. I haven't seen any references, direct references to Marx, for instance, but uh, that's a very interesting point once again. <laughs> Maybe you have to think about it. That's yeah. And what was the second? Second question about Nazism. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I think the, 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 the mm. idea is more to do with this uh, extreme enemy image yes. that you yes. have studied. But actually what is quite interesting is that the West is blamed for like extreme indi individualistic attitude, but Nazis were actually very organized. <laughs> so there's quite a kind of a contradiction between these. these yeah, but lines. then there, is this, there was this, in December uh, 2022, there was this big uh, conference on uh, their Nazification where some, some were presenting an uh, argument that this uh, German denazification failed and then it kind of uh, there was this uh, I ideas preserved in Europe as a, as a then legitimation for and at the same time they were presenting it as something to be used as a model to be used against Ukraine so mm -hmm. it was very bizarre to read this when there was the successful Ukrainian counteroffensive which tells again that they are totally divorced from What's, what's reality and what's then preferred as a preferred future in a way mm -hmm. within these uh, circles. 
Yes, actually there was one author who referred to seeds of Nazism that remained after the Second World War and those seeds started to grow and produce this contemporary yeah. Western Nazism. <laughs> We have continued the discussion after the second presentation. Thank you so, so much for your interest. Hello, can you hear us? Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, please share your, if you have the PowerPoint. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. so next one we have uh, Nina Andrinova from the Center of Military and Strategic Studies of the National Defense University, Ukraine. Welcome very, very much. Great to have you online. Can you share the share the slides? Uh, yeah, one moment, please. Yes, great. We will see you. You can see now? Yes, yes, everything is good. So go ahead, you have 30 minutes. Or a okay. bit less maybe, <laughs> so that we can discuss. Hello everyone again. Um, so I want to present you my topic, uh, the Russian imperial policy, uh, theory uh, and reality. Uh, the foreign policy of Russian Federation, especially under Vladimir Putin and towards the countries uh, of the so-called post-Soviet space, is often characterized as imperial. The imperial ideas of restoring Russian greatness, uh, the concept of spreading the Russian world along with other postulates, are rooted in the political ideology and social practice of the Russian ruling regime. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the hybrid Russian-Ukrainian war, Russian occupation of Ukrainian territories and full-scale aggression against Ukraine are the consequences of Russian imperial policy to preserve its sphere of influence, uh, building up offensive military capabilities and active use of military instruments in foreign policy. As uh, as you can see on the slide, the contemporary French philosopher Alain uh, de Benoist gave an appropriate definition of empire that can be compared uh, with Russia today. He said that empire is not a territory, but first and foremost an idea and a principle. Accordingly, the political order created by an empire is determined not so much uh, by material factors or control over geographical space as by idea of empire. A widespread definition of imperialism is a, it's a doctrine, political strategy, practice, state policy, or advocacy that consists in existing power by territory acquisition or by extending political and economical control outward over the areas. Uh, there are some signs of imperial policy. Uh, first of all, the idea of the greatness of the nation is the practice of building up and using force as a tool uh, to spread its influence and the idea of domination of uh, other political actors. And Russia current policy is corresponding to these signs. Uh, 
we can uh, uh, I want to present some model of imperial policy of Russian Federation of spreading its influence so it can be presented by uh, first theoretical applied basis and uh, dimensions of realization of, of imperial policy as you can see theoretical applied basis uh I want to look uh, through ethnic and cultural uh, concept, history, religion, and language. Uh, uh, so let's start from ethnic and cultural concept. Uh, the basis of imperial policy of the Russian Federation is based on reflection of such minds as Danilevsky, Leontiev, Berdeyev, Filipin, Gumilov, and others. Uh, all of them are representatives of ethnic and cultural concepts, ideological trends of Slavophilia, which focused more, more on the orientation towards Western Europe. According to this trend, Russia is a natural leader of all Slavic peoples. Next one, Pan-Slavism, uh, based on the idea that uh, Slavs need political uh, unification on the basis of ethnic, cultural, and linguistic commonality. Uh, but the ideas of Eurasianism and uh, Russian world became the most influential and widespread. The leading idea of Eurasianism is the proclamation of Russia as a special world, which is called Eurasia. This is a concept of an orthodox like super ethnicity, which uh, Russia is credited uh, with the ability to unite the population of Eurasia and assigned uh, the role of the core Eurasian integration. The ideology of the Russian world is also aided uh, to this as a justification of an imperial space and the exclusivity of the Russian civilization, which for, first of all acts as an uh, antithesis to Western European civilization. Hence, the traditional psychology on the of the surrounding fortress in the Russian imperial con conscience, uh, which always requires the authorities to build active defense around the empire in all directions. It should be noted uh, that uh, it was uh, Vladimir Putin who introduced the Russian world ideology into so social political discourse in 2006 and 2007 uh, during his speeches uh, to uh, compatriots living abroad. Uh, the Russian president emphasized the cultural, linguistic and civilization unity with Russia. Over the next five years, the use of Russian world concept by political elites uh, uh, somewhat decreased. Uh, it became a prerogative of a Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, the next one basis, it's uh, religion. Uh, Russian Orthodox uh, is defined by the Russian Federation as the basis of uh, building the state apparatus and relation in uh, society. A determining factor of foreign policy and education of the population at all levels. Russian Orthodox is one of the pillars of imperial policy. Russian Federation uses narrative that uh, the Russian Federation, Ukraine, Belarus, uh, and more recently Moldova are creating a modern Eastern Orthodox civilization on the historical space of Holy Rus. Uh, the state borders between these countries are convention, and most important thing is to project and strengthen the spiritual unity between the brotherly peoples. Uh, Russian Orthodox and the Russian state as its keeper were proclaimed direct uh, followers of Rome and Constantinople as centers of the Christian faith and great uh, Christian state in the concept Mo Moscow is the third Rome. In the manifestation of Russian imperial policy, the Russian government goes hand or in hand uh, with the representatives of the church. Colin Putin uh, 
uh, the when uh, the vainly elected ruler that justify Russia slavish expansionism actions and spread the same ideology as you can see <clears throat> the next one basis language uh, strengthening the position uh, and expanding the area of the Russian language is priority of Russian Federation. The Russian language and Russian speaking citizens are the basis of the imperial policy and they need to be protected wherever they are. Uh, Russian language is a unifying factor in the international community of citizens of different countries associated with Russia. Uh, Russia professes the myth that uh, the Ukrainian and Belarus languages come from the Russian language, which of course is not true. Uh, the Kievan princes spoke Ukrainian in Kievan Rus, uh, as evidenced by this uh, ancient literature finds writings on the walls of ancient church and some of the examples you can find on the screen. Uh, the next basis is the history. Uh, imperial policy of the Russian Federation is mainly based on the identification of itself as empire in the period of the sale proclaimed Russian empire by Peter the Great and the Soviet period when modern Russia was part of USSR and after its collapse self-proclaimed itself uh, as rightful successor. Uh, Russia is also trying to appropriate the history and name of Kievan Rus uh, on the 9th uh, to 13th centuries. Modern Russia comes from uh, Moscow as uh, a small settlement with Finnish name mentioned in literature sources only from the middle of the 12th century. Uh, I, actually, Russia actively writing history, reflecting it in literature, culture, and education, distorting facts in its favor, uh, sometimes inventing complaint uh, nonsense. It actively uses historical myths uh, the, to reproduce Russian imperialism. Uh, some of them you can find on the screen. And let's consider some dimension of realization of imperial policy. There are uh, political, uh, foreign policy, legal, information, military, military and strategic. First of all, uh, first of all is political. Uh, the model of political uh, system of modern Russian Federation is characterized by absence uh, of real competition and the actual absence of real opposition to the authorities of political pluralism. Uh, also, imitative forms of uh, political institution under the control of the authorities are developing. Today, Russia is an authoritarian state uh, where power is concentrated in the hand of one person, person uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, Putin is a great supporter of such uh, Russian conservative imperial thinkers as Danielevsky, Leontiev, Berdaev, Solovyov, Ilyin, uh, Gumilev, which we spoke earlier. And these ideas of uh, restoring the empire are firmly entrenched the, in the mind of the Russian president. And they were developed in annual uh, addresses of the president of the Russian Federation to the Federal Assembly, public speeches, his articles, interviews, etc. Few famous Putin's expressions you can find here on, on the screen. Uh, the next one, <clears throat> legal. Uh, Russia systematically uh, violates the norm of international law, but in its legislation, in it consistently advocates strengthening the legal foundation of international relation and fulfills its international legal obligation in good faith. The foundations of Russian imperial policy are conceptually established in a number of basic documents. Uh, some of them are the national security strategy, uh, military doctrine, and foreign policy concept. 
uh, national security strategy is the main document for planning and development of the national security system. Uh, and uh, this document contained uh, all the theoretical and applied bases which we discussed. Uh, there are, uh, the need for multipolar world. Russia is surrounded by unfriendly countries, especially the United States and its allies. Russia aims to rely on the con concept of uh, Eurasianism and rely on its own strengths because it no longer counts to partnership with West. Uh, Strengthening brother ties between the country of community of independent state and post soviet countries and others. In addition, the new version of the national security strategy faced informational security and the protection of traditional spiritual and moral, uh, moral val values. Also in this strategy underlined uh, a priority of nuclear weapons as uh, the highest priority for Russian defense and security and absolute guarantee of sovereignty, territorial integrity and global status. Uh, increasing the role of the military factor in world politics against the backdrop uh, of escalating confrontation along the uh, perimeter of the Russian borders. Uh, special attention to, is paid to Ukraine. <clears throat> and, and as a document, uh, the military doctrine, which actually correlates absolutely with the strategy in the fundamental issues and characterized the main direction of the state military policy at this historical stage. We will speak about military do doctrine a little bit uh, later uh, when we uh, discuss a uh, <clears throat> different dimension. And what is interesting is that uh, in new version of Russian foreign policy the concept which was adopted uh, last year, uh, it presents uh, Russia almost as separate cultural and civilization formation as a uh, Eurasian and Euro-Pacific uh, state that forms a separate cultural and civilization community of the Russian world. It also emphasized the need to further unite ethnic Russians abroad around a common language and culture. We also will speak about a uh, foreign policy concept a little bit later when we discuss another dimension. For, uh, the next one will be <clears throat> uh, foreign policy dimension. Uh, the formation of multipolar world is central narrative in uh, Russian foreign policy. Uh, Russia wants to take a leading position in the world. It's already a member of Group 20, permanent member of UN Security Council, uh, has large territory and rich in natural resources. And uh, its current status doesn't satisfy the ambition of uh, the current uh, Rus uh, Russian leadership. Sorry. In its foreign policy concept, in an effort uh, to take a rightful place in the network, uh, and not, Russia mentions that it is the rightful successor of the USSR, one of the uh, two largest nuclear states, and reminds of its key contribution to the victory in World War II. Uh, development uh, of its own concept of uh, the Great Eurasian Partnership. Uh, the implementation of this geoeconomic and geostrategic, geopolitical and also geostrategical project uh, should secure Russian interest and strengthen its position on the continent and is connected with the further development of Eurasian Economic Union in the post-Soviet space. Uh, the Great Eurasia project envisages the economic unification of such leading Asian countries as China, India, Pakistan, Iran, and many others. Uh, the next one, focus on cooperation with China. 
Uh, Russia is looking for a strong allies such as China or India. China has provided Russia with vital economical and diplomatic support in its full-scale invasion of Ukraine, and economic and military strategic cooperation is deepening. Uh, uh, some of experts... Five minutes, okay. Uh, the next dimension is information. Uh, and uh, if you don't mind uh, to save a time, I will stay on the last one, military and strategic dimension. Uh, the Kremlin actively building up its offensive military capabilities and actively using military tools and in its foreign policy. Uh, after, uh, after 2008, war against uh, Georgia, one of the main direction of Russia military policy was to reform and transform the Russian armed forces. Russia invasion in Georgia in 2008, annexation uh, of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, the capture and temporary occupation of Crimea in 2014, the temporary occupation of territories in Donetsk and Lugansk region and the full-scale uh, invasion in Ukraine are illustrative examples in the implementation of imperial policy of Russia. As a peculiarity of Russian modern warfare is an undeclared war with hidden goals, uh, where Russia denies its participation participations and uh, experts is exerts its influence through non-state actors, rebels, local population groups, organizations whose connection with Russia is formally completely denied. Uh, since the beginning of the large-scale invasion of Ukraine, an open military attack in 2022, by the Russian regular armed forces. The war in Ukraine has been called in Russia a special military operation to spread the Russian world, uh, justifying it's uh, a fight against Ukrainian Nazis and Banderis who offers the Russian spreading freaking population. And uh, to conclude, I want to say that uh, the main goal of imperial policy of Russian Federation is to increase its sphere of influence, uh, return the brotherly lands, it establish multipolar world order and the ability to control and dictate its terms to the civilized world. The main consequences of the implementation of the and realization of the imperial policy is the war, death, scarred earth, broken destinies. And as we can see from the Kremlin imperial ambitions and appetites, if Russia succeeds in seizing Ukraine, which is the first priority, uh, also the beginning of Brzezinski said uh, that without Ukraine, Russia is uh, 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 is no longer empire, but with Ukraine controlled and enslaved, Russia becomes an empire automatically. So it will not stop there. And so it will be with anyone who resists Russia will and wants to leave its own, own influence and who will be the next and will decide just <laughs> Russian. Thank you. Thank you, Nina, very much. Can you please uh, stop the share so we can have a bigger, <laughs> bigger picture of you? And now, uh, as a chair, <laughs> I would like to welcome questions to to Nina, and then we probably I maybe repeat them so that you can you can hear. So can you still do the one step away we from the sharing the slides? Yeah. Okay, okay, so, so um, first colleague. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Thank you very much, Nina, for a very interesting and great presentation. And I have two questions. One, I would like to clarify in the second slide where you have this indicators of imperial policies. The third point was that the uh, domination of other political actors. And I wanted to clarify, is it mean the domestic authoritarianism or does is it mean meant into in the international context domination over? I mean, what political actors uh, and who dominates? Uh, and so, sorry, uh -huh. can you hear any, anything? Uh, I hear, but very, very uh, in bad ways. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, can yeah, you so repeat for It's better than I don't repeat. I'm so sorry. Hi, hi. Uh, hi, hi. Uh, so thank you very much for your presentation. So I had the two questions. One concerning the second slide where you have uh, the indicators of uh, of uh, imperial policies, the third point of uh, dominance of other political actors. I wanted to clarify uh, uh, who dominates and what are political actors. So is it uh, internal, domestic authoritarianism, or is it meant in the international context? That is one question. And second one, I was curious about this uh, claim that Putin is a godly chosen ruler. So maybe you can say where you got evidence of this in Russian discourse, because I honestly haven't come up, uh, across such one. Uh, so it would be great to know. But also in a uh, follow up from that, so why do they need uh, elections to legitimize Putin in, in that case? So these are two questions from uh, Thank you. Please, Nina. Uh. Uh, thank you for your question. <clears throat> uh, first of all, I want to say uh, about uh, domination over the other political actors. Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, in this way, that Russia. Uh, want to dominate uh, in the world, in the world, uh, to dictate its um, its position, its uh, vision of uh, world order, and uh, first uh, and strong uh, uh, example of its domination, its domination of, first of all, of uh, post-Soviet countries uh, where Russia uh, influence on uh, the country's view. Uh, as you know, for example, in 2014, when Ukraine decided to enter the European Union, uh, what uh, consequences uh, were? You can see you now. The second question is, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, God, God, God chosen. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I uh, read it in some articles and uh, uh, so it it in interview of uh, uh, um, uh, for example patriarch kirill uh, who is uh, seriously supported putin in his policy and in his ideology uh, thank you so there there is a Please uh, come also yeah. here to, <laughs> to ask the question. And would we have an, another question from the audience? Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, uh, Russia, working deliberately step by step, created a very sophisticated political dilemma. And uh, right now, strategy is trying to find out solution for that dilemma. I would like to hear your opinion. And now I will explain that dilemma in a couple of uh, words. Uh, the changes of Russian constitution in 2020, uh, one of the changes stated that no one feet of Russian territory could be given away by any power and any ruler. The law of public uh, authorities of 2021 
changed the Russian uh, government, uh, state structure from federal to the unilateral structure. And this allowed to incorporate occupied Ukrainian territories, and they became the Euro Russian state. And the uh, Russian military doctrine states that nuclear weapons could be used when enemy enters Russian territory. So now we are having dilemma. If Ukraine wants to restore the borders to the year of 1991, we are facing the blackmail of Russia for nuclear weapons to be used. The solution so far is not made out. I know that it's very difficult, and I would be very surprised if you have the explanation and solution, but I would like to know what you think about that. Thank you. Uh, give me just one minute, please. Uh, I want to Thank think on this question. Uh, I, I don't blame you. It's, uh, <laughs> I think we all are. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, but we would very much just like to hear you. How you see that situation? There is no solution so far. Yeah, it's a, a dilemma that has no easy solution but uh, something that we should think hard. But it threatens you, it threatens your territory, and you have a position. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, serious uh, and very important and interesting questions. It's hard to say this, but uh, it's hard to predict. Uh, but uh, when the war in Ukraine started, uh, nobody believes that it could be possible. And uh, we don't know if Russia will use a uh, nuclear weapon. Uh, so nobody knows and there is uh, no uh... so it could be, it could be possible. It's really very high possibility that Russia will use a nuclear weapon in any way. Unfortunately, we don't have a, uh, uh, yeah, but Bohdan, please uh, come to ask your question and then Kati in the beginning and Jyrki there. It was uh, less of a question, but maybe uh maybe stimulate some, uh, some discussion on, on this dilemma, right, and offer uh, maybe a perspective. So I think it's a false dilemma, and I think it's just another use of uh, lawfare uh, that Russia is obviously very good at using all the instruments of power uh, to create this dilemma in our, in our minds, right? Um, the articulation of so-called red lines as to when uh, Russia would use nuclear weapons uh, I no longer believe that there are such, such red lines, and they've never been articulated in any very precise way by Russian leadership, right? So that includes, uh, you know, infringing on uh, so-called occupied uh, territories. So I think that um, that dilemma was created intentionally and, and those laws were passed in particular to cause, cause us to, to pause and, cons and, and, and uh, essentially prevent us uh, from from uh, doing action. When I say us, I'm talking about uh, about the West. Um, I think if you ask Ukraine, uh, so in every instance today on the front, uh, they're taking you know in NATO. So I work at Allied Command Transformation. Um, NATO is often you to see the leadership say not one inch, right? Well, if the if the law here applies for Russia and it's a not one inch, well, the front line is is uh, is always moving, right? So every every day. Uh, Ukraine is taking back an inch or giving an inch and every time Ukraine takes an inch I don't see nuclear weapons being used right even uh, tactical or anything right so so it's, it's, it's interesting right but the reality is that I think that uh, you know you know Putin does this uh, on, on purpose and Russia is extremely good at using all instruments of power to essentially make us pause and and, and uh, paralyze us in a, in a sense so that's what I just wanted to offer thank you if you have anything I'd Nina appreciate it Nina, go ahead if you yeah. want to comment or, or was, was Jürgen your, your comment on, on this? Actually, thank you that you helped me to answer this question. This question.
expect that you Yuki might have something something similar. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I actually um, wanted also to to go back a little bit to to uh, Katri your your presentation. Um, because it, it comes to this uh, this issue of, of, of a dilemma. Because um, if one looks at at the Kremlin rhetorics, uh, <clears throat> like they they often often move in in all of these dimensions that you described, like uh, they they seem to move uh, around them, like uh, as time passes, uh, depending on the on the context and on the on the um, on the situation that. Uh, that they find themselves in. So if if if, uh, if they are on the losing side, like the the existential and apocalyptic scenarios start to start to sort of uh, come more upfront in in the rhetorics. And lately, um, <clears throat> uh, I have noticed that uh, <laughs> that the Kremlin has started talking more about interests, as as you mm -hmm. as you described uh, the the sort of political military. Uh, Sort of dimension of the of of the uh, of their thinking is becoming more upfront, and they are talking less about their Nazification. They are talking more about uh, about Russia's interests currently, and in 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 a way, this also comes, I, I would believe, like to to the to this dilemma, um, because uh, but but then what what should we uh, sort of Conclude of that is is, is a question of uh, whether uh, like Kremlin's policies actually still are more or less opportunistic uh, because you can't be existential and uh, interest based at the same time if you are not opportunistic. Like if mm -hmm. if you are imp imperialist, you are imperialist. Uh, if you, if you strive for for existential victory, then you strive for existential victory. You don't change it uh, like every other day to to the interest-based talk. So that's why um, there's a question like whether you see that there is still like this element of uh, opportunism in in uh, in Russia's policies. Thank you. Yeah, maybe Nina, if I I briefly answer and then we give floor to Kati and then we come back to back to you and. Maybe you comment. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, because I, I thank you, Jyrki, for this uh, this idea that in a way is important when we talk about the dilemma that was presented and and uh, an opportunity to interpret it, because that is in a way part of our uh, reason for for using this uh, specific analytical framework so that we can. We can analytically uh, differentiate different uses of certain rhetoric and certain thinking of war, so to better get the idea how it is used as an instrument of policy in specific time frame. frame. So we are not with Kati in a way looking it, putting it in together with with the time frame of war, but others have done it. So in that sense. Um, there could be this interpretation of opportunistic thinking in, in the Russian conduct. But nevertheless, I think the lesson for the West is that uh, we just need to better understand the using of these narratives in, in, in shaping the international environment to, to benefit Russia and not to go there in a way to create a situation that benefits Russia and, and, and not Ukraine. So it is needed for the better analysis, but not should, we shouldn't fall into that trap um, in either way. So I think that was very good, good point. And now, Kati, please, you, you had a question, and, and then we go back to Nina. Yes, thank you, Nina, for a very interesting and comprehensive uh, presentation. Actually, I want, to, I want to go back to this idea of empire, because some three years ago, Vladimir Medinsky actually published a long text in which he argued that Russia is essentially an empire. 
And one reason for that was, according to him, that there is EU, and EU is a kind of empire. And of course, uh, Medinsky has this very Eurasianist tone also. Uh, it can be seen in his writings that he kind of uh, promotes this Eurasianist thinking. And that was part of that essay also. But I would like to ask that have you encountered a similar comparison that is kind of uh, the idea of Russia as an empire justified by the idea of EU as a kind of empire or the United States as a kind of empire. So have you seen this kind of comparison? Thank you. So Nina, go ahead. <laughs> Kati's question. Uh, what I want to answer is that <clears throat> uh, on this question already answered Toffler uh, when uh, he divided uh, the types of imperia. Uh, actually, uh, uh, what I want to say about Russian imperial, it's not a classical one. It's not a, a, a territory. Uh, it, it's not correspond to a, a, a territorial, hmm? a territorial political science. Uh, it's based on idea. And I started my uh, presentation uh, from uh, French philosophy uh, that he uh, he described imperia and in uh, this basis in its basis he uh, uh, he described idea so we couldn't uh, compare for example uh, Great Britain, uh, European Union with Russia as in imperial way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, would there be any other comments? Would you have any anything to add, Nina, uh, to the audience? Because if, if not, then we we could also uh, end the session and, and, and uh, continue, continue later the, the discussions. So once again, uh, really big thank you for your very comprehensive presentation on, on the topic. Um, thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you for your question. Thank you for your support. And we are really sorry that we couldn't be with you now. Yeah, let's, let's hope that it will be possible soon and then continue cooperation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. And thank you all for great questions again and interest towards our, our panel.
Hello, everybody. I'm researcher at the research, Russia Research Group. Pentiforsum is my name, and, and uh, I have the privilege to moderate this se next session. And there should be Valery Hordichuk on the line. Yes, I'm oh, here. Oh, yep. Sir. Merci. I'm just waiting for my turn. Yeah, it will come shortly. Yeah. Hello, Valery. He's uh, doctor and colonel. Valery Hardichuk, and, and he's heading the research department at the Center for Military and Strategic Studies in the National Defense University of Ukraine. And he's uh, having, having a PhD in technical sciences in uh, information technology, and his main interests are art of war, military policy and strategy, and transformation and integration different processes in military sphere. And he will be speaking about uh, Russian strategy in a hybrid war against Ukraine and how the kinetic and non-kinetic actions are combined in order to achieve effect. Valery, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Yes. So, <clears throat> oh, uh, good afternoon to everybody. Hope uh, that your lunch was uh, tasty and now we will have enough energy to continue our work. Uh, <clears throat> you can see the uh, topic of my speech uh, for today. Uh, and um, the seed of my uh, speech will be uh, a synergetic effect of the um, combined uh, force uh, in the uh, kinetic and non-kinetic dimension of Russia. So let's start the presentation. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, to uh, give main main bullets, main main milestones of uh, the evolution of hybrid aggression in Ukraine. So um, we divided it in uh, four phases. Uh, so uh, the Russian politics towards Ukraine has gone all the way from the policy of uh, using soft power and the hybrid threats uh, to a hybrid war with a large scale armed aggression. Uh, it is possible to distinguish four stages of this path. Uh, the use of soft power politics, uh, conviction in Eur uh, Eurasian integration under the uh, a species of the Russian Federation, the use or the use of the of a wide range of hybrid actions, uh, which cover the political, diplomatic, economic, energy, informational spheres, uh, etc., uh, with the aim of forcing integration with Russia. With Russia, uh, hybrid aggression with the aim of the next one is hybrid aggression uh, with the aim of annexing a strategically and economically important part of the territory of Ukraine. Uh, sig significantly uh, re reducing its economic potential and ensuring political control over the government of Ukraine. And that uh, that we have now, uh, a large-scale high-intensity war with the aim of occupying uh, and uh, annexing entire territory of Ukraine. Uh, so, <clears throat> in the framework of that, uh, empirical policy and ideology that uh, was mentioned, that was discussed during the uh, Nina's speech. Uh, at the stage of the hot phase of the hybrid war that we have now, which involves the uh, direct use of uh, uh, kinetic armed aggression, uh, there is a need uh, to study uh, the use of conventional and non-conventional actions in synergy. Therefore, the analysis of the most significant, from our point of view, uh, cases of such hybrid uh, synergy after the start of the full-scale invasion of Russia into Ukraine will be carried out. In particular, according to the following characteristics, goal, tools, operational and strategic consequences. 
the first one that we um, um, will describe the hybrid campaigns, uh, in, informational psychological, uh, psychological campaign, special military operations operation. Uh, there will be on the slides uh, goals and tools, and I will pronounce uh, the uh, strategic and operational consequences of it. Uh, so, informational preparation and Russian zombification began uh, long before the February uh, 24. Uh, for years, Kremlin has been spending incredible amounts of money on means of information influence, in laying everything possible with the narrative with, with its narratives. As we know, Russian tanks never enter first. First come uh, the Moscow Church, Ballet, Bulgakov, Tchaikovsky, the Russian language, and only then do the tanks enter. On the figure, uh, uh, a photo session of Russian soldiers with the uh, Balerians in Yekaterinburg. A better illustration of the Russian strategy of hybrid aggression cannot be imaged. So the operational consequences of the, this campaign which so-called special military operation. Absolute support for armed aggression by the population of the Russian Federation, partial support for armed aggression by the pro-Russian population of Ukraine and the world. Possibility of deploying a wide agent network on the territory of Ukraine from among supporters of Putin's politics. Weakening of international support due to the cognitive dissonance created by the common audience. The use of conflicts and uh, imperfections uh, of the norms of international law to legitimize armed aggression. The next one, energy as a weapon. Strategic and operational consequences. Ukraine's energy uh, has a heating infrastructure exceeds $10 billion uh, 22 of uh, 36 power plants are damaged, destroyed, or unavailable, and around 50% of Ukraine's energy facilities were damaged. It's information as for April uh, 2023. The next one, the Eurozone registered an economic recession for a certain period. Uh, influence on the decision of some countries to support Ukraine partially works. Europe is redoubling. Uh, its efforts to break its dependence on Russian uh, hydrocarbons. And finally, energy continued to be a key factor of, in Russia's foreign economic and geopolitical uh, influence. Next one is nuclear intimidation and blackmail. So the goals and tools are on the screen and uh, I will pronounce the consequences. Excitement among the civilian population of Ukraine and countries bordering in Russia. Russia's threats to a, of a nuclear catastrophe allowed, uh, allowed to demonstrate its barbarism. This increased the uh, determination of uh, some countries and international organizations to support Ukraine. Captured nuclear infrastructure in violation in, of international norms is successfully used by the occupying forces as a shield, which gives them certain uh, operational and tactical advantages. Russian, uh, so, but, but, but Russians uh, have not been able to organize the production of electricity from captured nuclear facilities in their interests so far. Given the unpredictability, un un unpredictability uh, defeatism and uh, idiotic determination of Putin and his pocket uh, potentates, it is necessary to consider the fact that the order to use nuclear weapon, tactical or even otherwise, is unlikely but potentially possible. This is one, one of the answers for the question that was uh, put it pre raised pre in the previous speech, uh, Nina's speech. Next one, food as a weapon. So the goals you can read and tools you can read from the monitor and uh, what about the operational and strategic consequences. Russian food blackmail partially worked. Russia and uh, the UN continue contacts in an attempt to push the connection to Rossilhos Bank, Bank Swift, 
in another way uh, and the russia used another diplomatic way to connect and uh, with the united nations and uh, uh, use another ways to 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 try to uh, to find another ways to to influence these uh, international organizations the export of agricultural products by land from Ukraine led to political tension in the transit countries. You know about the tensions on the border uh, with the Poland, Hungary, Romania. Russian Federation captured the traditional agricultural markets for Ukrainian products. Using uh, excessive pressure, Russian Federation forced Ukrainian, Ukraine and its allies to look for ways to unblock the sea and as a result, lost dominance in the Black Sea. And finally, Russian dealt a tangible blow to the economy of Ukraine. Also, it can lead uh, to a global uh, in increase in food prices, especially in the poorest countries. Next one. Are the mining uh, hydroelectric power plants? So on the it is the uh, the consequences uh, or after this is like a flooding after explosion on the Kohovka power plant uh, hydroelectric power plants uh, on the on this photo. So the consequences: large scale flooding of settlements. Uh, significantly dis destabilize the situation in the region. In the, it means it's about the south, south and southern uh, west, southern east regions of Ukraine. Ukraine lost its annual supply of drinking water. Large areas turned into a, de a desert, etc. Next one, cut off the Ukrainian troops for a certain time, stopping the uh, counteroffensive in the southern direction. Ecological and potential threats of a nuclear nature due to problems with cooling the reactors of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. And uh, other. And uh, the final one is the cyber terrorism. Uh, in a number of cases, uh, cyber activities caused significant interference in the work of uh, information and communication systems of Ukraine. A powerful cyber campaign provoked the emergence of a phen phenomenon uh, of quite successful cyber resilience, thanks to the con consolidation of the Ukrainian and uh, international cyber community. Cyber aggression uh, of the Russian Federation but the cyber aggression of the Russian Federation did not uh, achieve its initial goals. The OU, uh, however, the OU is not e exhaustive. The Russian Federation also used other tools of hybrid warfare, controlled migration and deportation of the population. The challenge of the demographic uh, crisis, use of all possible levers. Uh, of international law and international relations. So, as you know, as, as we can see uh, from the situation, uh, the war in Ukraine revealed uh, uh, the efficiency of a number of international organizations and uh, their structural divisions, in particular, the United Nations Security Council, the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement, UNICEF or SCE, etc. Creation and financing of various political entities of the territory of other states and bribery of officials. Impact on the supply chains of a number of raw materials and food. That's causing uh, fluctuations in prices of world markets and uh, reducing the rate of economic growth. Uh, the use of the church and religion in interest of support and aggression and other more, etc. So, having studied the works of international researchers, think tanks and research institutions, uh, the following groups of hybrid warfare impacts, also known as like uh, operational dimensions, uh, for, uh, for further research, informational cognitive, 
cyber, financial, economic, international, political, or diplomatic, with the diplomatic, military, and spatial. Spatial, like ecological, religious, social, etc. So we uh, we prioritize them using the simplest method, the method of an expert assessment by simple arrangement based uh, on the analysis of hybrid campaigns. Campaigns using the method of an expert assessment uh, involving the uh, uh, center of military and strategic studies experts, including the out author of this research. We gave scores from one to six, characterizing the intensity of impact by the consequences. In each individual hybrid influence campaign, where uh, six is the highest score and the highest impact, and uh, one is the lowest one. So uh, the, the slide gives us um, infographics some infographics that so on the figure one uh, uh, you can see the illustration of the percentage of each uh, hybrid influence uh, in the hybrid warfare totally thus it can be con concluded that among the analyzed most significant according to the authors and uh, experts uh, cases the most intensive in the hot phase of russian uh, hybrid aggression uh, so I, I should mention that uh, remark that it concludes um, the the press preface preface with the informational preparing before the twenty uh, fourth of February. So the most intensive in the hot phase of Russian hybrid aggression was the informational con cognitive influence, even in the hot phase, when the uh, large uh, use of uh, kinetic actions uh, uh, we see. Uh, so and there, here uh, the, the hierarchical prioritization of this uh, uh, of these influences looks like uh, the first one is uh, informational cognitive, the second uh, the military uh, influence, third international, political, and diplomatic. On the fourth place, cyber and the financial, economic, and the the last one is like special, logical, social, social, religious, religious, etc. Uh, but it should be taken into account that this is fair when implementing a counter strategy for smoldering conflict characteristic, uh, uh, conflict characteristic of a war of exhaustion, which uh, is provided by Russia now in Ukraine. But on the figure two, uh, also uh, on the figure two, the most active and the most intense influences uh, are determined by the mag magic quadrant method. The number of hybrid companies determines the activity where uh, one or another influence had a power greater than average, about three points. Intensity is determined by a simple rating from the rating table. Uh, thus, uh, we can see that the most active and the intensive influences are information uh, cognitive, military, and international political. Cyber and economic influence are in identified uh, as powerful but less active, and the special one, which is ecological, religious, social, etc., is defined as the uh, least active uh, and least powerful among the analyzed campaign of hybrid aggression. Another issue is uh, another issue that arises is firefighting. What does it mean? It is necessary to take a number of measures to prevent the cumulative effect of hybrid influence campaigns, such as the absorbed during the blowing up uh, the Kahovka hydroelectric power plant dam in June 2023. In order to prevent the possibility of such actions by the enemy, it is necessary to protect oneself as if this act will definitely be carried out. For example, having, a, having an information uh, about the possible uh, undermining of Kahovka hydroelectric power plant, it is necessary to take all, necess all uh, need measures uh, to reduce the negative impact, evacuate the population in advance, provide rescue services with the appropriate equipment, consider uh, redistributing energy supply from backup sources, etc. So in the figure uh, 3, the peaks, uh, 
uh, the highest score six of a certain type of influence in different hybrid campaigns are exactly the fires that need to be prepared for. In the case of the hot phase of, of a hybrid war, kinetic actions serve as a detonator to provoke a cumulative hybrid effect. Therefore, physical protection remains the number, on, number one task in a, a war with the open armed conflict. In addition, figure three uh, demonstrates how different combinations of hybrid influence types can be. We see uh, uh, how the graphs uh, intersect uh, uh, in a quasi chaotic manner. So the conclusions, as it, as it clear from above, uh, to organize and ensure the conduct of a large-scale hybrid war, the Russian Federation used all ex executive power bodies and the means uh, by which they manage them. The range of domains and dimensions of hybrid activities is extremely broad. In order to contain such attacks uh, and not to violate the critically important foundations of the state functioning, Ukraine needs to create an effective mechanism to, of resilience. Accordingly, it is possible, with the full involvement of all state authorities and relevant means. Nevertheless, the goal must justify the means, which is especially important for Ukraine now. Russia accumulates resources, resources and in the process continue to deplete Ukrainian resources. While the difference in the economic indicators of, of Russia and Ukraine is not times, but orders of magnitude. Therefore, a very urgent task for Ukraine is to spend uh, on defense and security exactly as much as it's necessary, and if more, then not significantly. In this purpose, it is necessary to be able to determine correctly the need for the resource necessary for the expenditure. It is the task that this work was devoted to, and an appropriate scientific and met methodological approach was proposed for the hybrid integration of various types of influence aimed uh, at countering various campaigns of hybrid aggression. And so this is the end of my presentation. I want to, I hope that uh, it was uh, not only interesting, but uh, useful for you. And I want to say, to th to, to say thank you for all heroes who are protect uh, Ukraine now from different countries and who are support us and uh, give give us their hand of uh, friendship. Thank you, glory to Ukraine, glory to Finland, and glory to all heroes. Thank you, Valery. <clears throat> We have some some five minutes time to, for for short questions or comments. So please, if somebody has, please come forward and, and talk to the microphone. Yes, Claire. Uh, could could you please come here while while it doesn't uh, in the morning it didn't the speakers couldn't hear. The, So please. Yes, Valerie. Valerie? Yes, could, could you hear me? Yes. Yes, you are. Okay. Perfect. I am Claire, the French Defense Attaché. Uh, first of all, congratulations for your attack on the Cesar Kunikov today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I would like to know if you, regarding your experience in Ukraine, if you know and if you see some similarities between uh, the process from soft power to uh, aggression war, war uh, in Georgia and in Ukraine. Yes. So, <laughs> mm, it is. It is. Uh, it need. It need to be mentioned that, uh, as for as from my point of view, from my side, uh, is the most dangerous way. Uh, for the situation in Ukraine, for the war in Ukraine, when the conflict in Ukraine will be frozen, 
for some time and the uh, political instruments and uh, hybrid instrument uh, based on this uh, uh, full scale uh, armed aggression uh, will be used to to um, for for the pressure uh, on the government institutions and um, uh, if we will compare these two conflicts um, that that way that was uh, uh, yeah, that, that, that was based uh, uh, by Georgia is not appropriate for us because uh, in fact Georgia. Uh, Lose, lost. We will not speak all the sovereignty, but uh, the the part of it it, it was lost by Georgia, uh, and without uh, the uh, large using of uh, kinetic actions. Uh, but what what leads to to this situation? Lack of international support uh in georgia and we do not to, do not want that that scenario um was raised again appeared again in ukraine that's why uh, we try to uh to push to 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 uh, gather all our efforts uh to to give the information about the war in ukraine to our to international community to to you to our uh friends uh, and predict you uh, do not do not uh, uh, forget about Ukraine because uh, uh, Ukraine now are losing um, the the most expensive uh, that that we have the, the, it's our blood our lives but you are having uh, the security and uh, this is. Um, uh, ex exchange uh, that uh, European countries uh, should should not underestimate. For example, such, such countries like Hungary or or other one, and um, it it can provoke unpredictable consequences. Thank you very much for your for your presentation. My name is Céline Maranger. I'm from the, the the Institute for Strategic Research, that is affiliated with the French Ministry of Armed Forces. I have a question uh, um, about the combination of hybrid means. Uh, what is, uh, in your opinion, the most effective combination uh, of uh, various hybrid uh, means? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for, for your question. Uh, nice to meet you as well. Uh, there are different approaches to estimate how to, uh, uh, to how to counter a hybrid aggression, um, uh, to combine different instruments, to combine different types of influence, to combine different forces, and etc. Uh, as and uh, as it was earlier, we tried to based. Um, the assessment how to do it uh, uh, based based on the scenarios uh, of uh, future um, of of how it can uh, how it can the situation can evaluate, but now we have the hot phase and then as we based our uh, findings on the on this. Uh, hybrid campaigns and it's uh, i think that this uh, this problem is not only the ukrainians one uh, i i guess that nato countries uh, uh, try to uh, manage this issue too with uh, using this uh, new um, new strategy of multi-domain operations and uh, this is what, as for me, is this is the one of the most effective tool to to counter this uh, this these threats, hybrid threats. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could you please, Valery, uh, uh, stop sharing the uh, yep. and chase the speaker? Once, Once more, thank, thank you uh, for the attention and uh, have a fruitful work further. 
can you take part on the panel panel discussion? Yes, I will be here all the time. Yes, thank you. You can count on me. We will. Uh, I'd like to present. Can you Emma hear us? Yes, I'm here. Uh, uh, Emma Shimbanga is uh, 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 head of the department in the International Military Cooperation in the field of armaments and military equipment of the State Scientific Research Institute of Armament and Military Equipment Testing and Certification. And, and uh, I think, is, is Dmitro also there beside you? Yes, okay. he's next to me. So, yeah. He didn't, yeah. Uh, probably, probably you can, can see him on screen. Yeah, yeah. We, we will see it. Yeah, thank you. So there is a two persons. Uh, and we will hear a, a, a speech on, on study of the results of the military operations uh, on the territory of Ukraine in relation to changing political objectives. Uh, Emma and, and Mitro, please. Yeah. Uh, could you please yeah, we, give me the feedback? Yeah, we, I'm not sure. Yeah, we will see it. We we'll see it quite clear. You see, yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, dear colleagues, it is a great honor for us to be present today at this international scientific event. We believe that this event is very important and relevant. We wish and hope uh, for productive work at address and discuss the fundamental problems of our time. So uh, our, we're going to talk today on the topic of a study of the impact of military operation in Ukraine on the change in political goals of Russia. I'm not sure why I can't change the next slide. I'm just sorry, I have got some problems with... Yeah, I'll try to reopen the presentation and maybe it will work. Yeah, sorry for... Mm -hmm. Okay. And to understand, yeah, yeah, now it's functioning. And to understand the topic of the study, it is necessary to get acquainted with the concept of the philosophy of war and its importance for our work. The philosophy of war and its impact on social, political goals and relations in society are covered in many works by the domestic and foreign philosophers and scholars. One of these fundamental works is the book on war by the Prussian general Karl von Clausewitz, which in turn is one of the most important trees on military political analysis uh, and strategy ever written. And remains, remains both controversial and influential for strategic thinking. The military philosophical thinking of the leadership of the Russian Federation, which is undisputed aggressor in the Russian Ukrainian war of the early 21st century has many thoughts and theories required careful study and analysis in order to stop and prevent similar violations of the psychoethical and political um, foundation, foundations recognized by international law and uh, society as whole. Uh, in the course of writing this paper, uh, the political goals and basic principles of Russian military and political leadership during the armed aggression of the Russian Federation uh, as the relationship between the political goals of the state leadership and the war. And going next to, to the next slide, the relevance of the chosen topic lies, first of all, in the existence of such a horrific uh, Russian-Ukrainian war of the early 21st century. Men, lives lost, the violation of social norms and laws, economic, uh, economic losses and the um, poisoning of ecosystems, all these factors force us to study this topic in order to prevent similar violations of social, ethical and political 
norms uh, recognized by international law and society as well. In our article, we have set the following goals, uh, which are obtaining the necessary information understanding the relationship between political objectives and warfare, studying the chronological sequence of military events and their impact on Russian political decisions, and study how Russia political goals change based on outcome of the hostilities in Ukraine. Following research methodology was used to write the article, so we use chronological analysis of the war objectives and the dependence of changing objectives of military results, changing for the relation between between Russian propaganda narratives and the results of hostilities, content analysis of speeches by the Russian Federation leadership. The result of the article is a contact analysis of the main political speeches of the political and military elite of Russian Federation, chronological sequence of events aimed to achieving the goals set from the armed forces of Russian Federation. Uh, the consequences of hostilities, personal losses, and the main statement of propaganda. The independence of uh, various factors that influence each other is established. Um, going to the next slide, uh, we're going to obtain the necessary uh, information and understand the relation between political goals and war. It is advisable to build a chronological sequence of military events and their impact on the political decisions of Russian leadership, and to study the existing uh, relationship between changing in results of hostilities on the territory of Ukraine depending on Russia's political goals. Um, there is a steady dependence of political goals of the state of the results of hostilities, which in turn are the ratio of losses among the personnel and equipment in attempts to achieve the goal and the result obtained after the certain period of time. Uh, the analysis of the base narratives of Russian propaganda shows that they are transforming depending on the situation on the front, events in the world and within Russia. In addition, there is a certain time lag between events and emergencies of narratives. Changes in propaganda narratives have a similar nature of interdependence on hostilities and goals set by the political authorities of the state. Uh, to this day, Russia's position and political goals are concentrated in the eastern part of Ukraine. And at the end of January 2023, Vladimir Putin named the purpose of the special operation as protecting people and Russia itself from threats that are, um, that are being created in the adjacent historical Russian territories. Failures on the contact line force changes in goals and strategies for their implementation and changes in political goals in turn force of choices of other ways to achieve their goals. It is safe to say that any changes in either goals or ways of achieving them, firstly, involve changes in dependent components. And secondly, there is a certain period of time required to create a reaction and implement those changes. At the moment, Russia has failed miserable in achieving its goals and has no positively consequences for itself. Analysis uh, argue that anal analytic uh, argue that the conflict in Ukraine is transforming into the war of uh, attrition. The scenario uh, became relevant when Russia changed its strategy after failing to achieve its initial goals. And dear colleagues, we are now going to show you the results of our own, namely the developed chronological sequence of main political statements of Russian authorities, uh, as well as their dependence on the losses of armed forces, personal uh, political goals and results that followed the, these elements. As you see here, on the 24th February 2022, Vladimir Putin announced the start of the special military operation to justify the inversion. The Russian president repeated 
uh, speech uh, by Russian propaganda, such as it is necessary to carry out denazification and demilitarization, and modern Ukraine is run by Nazi supports and corrupt officials. The latter have allegedly brought Ukraine to uh, the brink of bankruptcy and are mocking those who support Russia. However, Putin is trying to convince the entire civil civilized world that the state of Ukraine is only kept flawed by Russia. Uh, immediately after the invasion of Ukraine, Soviet uh, uh, invasion of Ukraine, Russia made uh, significant gains, but quickly uh, stalled and eventually lost its potential and offensive effectiveness. After the failure of their plans, uh, the defeat of the first echelon of Russian troops and heavy losses among personnel and equipment. The Russian leadership in the following days decided to change its goals and use the theory of ideological philosophy of quick virus war, which could firstly demonstrate the strength and power of the Russian armed forces, their military technology and scientific uniqueness. And secondly, secondly prize the motto and uh, patriotic spirit of Russian Federation armed forces and, and society as well. At that time, the constant propaganda technique was to remind people of the history and ideas of World War II. Then the Soviet Army was when the Soviet Army was powerful and made a significant contribution to the victory. And on March uh, 2022, the head of the main operational Directorate, the general staff of Russian Armed Forces, Sergei Rudsky, uh, publicity said, the main goal of the special operation is to help the people of uh, Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republic who have been subjected to genocide by the Kyiv regime for eight years. It was impossible to achieve this goal through political means. Kyiv policy uh, refused to implement the Minsk Agree agreements. That was his words. And political goals from the capture of Kyiv and Ukraine, the change of political leadership, and so-called denazification and demilitarization de have changed to helping people at, uh, in the Donetsk and Luhansk public, uh, public sorry, people's uh, republic. And this became possible due to several factors. The main one being the Russia's army's failures on most of fronts, heavy losses among personnel and equipment, and the understanding that Russia urgently needs to rescue the line to, of contact and decrease the concentration of troops on the main di uh, directions. The Russian military of foreign affairs uh, continues to state that the goal of the war is to weaken the influence of the United States and NATO. And Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov expresses hope for negotiation and a quick end to the war. Due to the factors that Russian armed forces did not achieve their goals in June, August 2022. Russia tries to undermine the moral of Ukrainians, launching missile strike against civilian infrastructure. And on 14th of July, Russia launched a missile attack on the House of Officers uh, and the Central Square in Vinnytsia. 27 people were killed, including three children, a four year girl and boys aged seven and eight, and more than 200 people were injured, where Russian attacked the camp where, uh, where Ukrainian soldiers were captured, and it was held on 28th, 29th of July, violating international humanitarian laws. The peak periods of uh, denial of Russians' war crimes, violation of international humanitarian laws in Ukraine, and changes in political goals and ways to justify them are observed in April, May, August to September and November 2022, when the Ukrainian arm, army was uh, liberating the occupied territories and uh, inflicting heavy losses on Russian side among its personnel and equipment. Russian constant uh, disinformation through most of 2022 was the use of chemical 
biological and nuclear weapons, as well as dirty bombs with nuclear waste, which was used to uh, divert attention from Russian actions. For example, report of the threats of dirty bombs uh, served on on the information space in October 2022 during the crisis around the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Created by the Russians, the shutdown of its power unit blocking the work of the IAEA mission and the deployment of military contingent at the plant. After uh, Ferris fighting uh, under Kyiv and Kharkiv, Ukraine announced a deceptive counteroffensive in Kherson sector and launched an effective counteroffensive in Kharkiv region, liberating almost all of its occupied territory during the active period from the 6th to the 9th of September 2022. The total 300 settlements in the Kharkiv region for about 3,800 the square kilometers of territory within population of uh, approximately um, one, um, 150,000. At the time, the Russian leadership was confused and lacked clear plans and goals. Due to the defeat and the need to explain to the public the loss of control over Kharkiv region, it was claimed that the political purpose of leaving the Kharkiv region was to ease tension with Russia and demonstrate readiness for political concessions to achieve peace and certain agreements, but these were false claims. On the contrary, Russia has launched an operation to deliberately destroy Ukraine's energy infrastructure using drones received from Iran. At the same time, it took Russia almost two weeks to identify and set new goals, which led to announcement of the decree of um, partial mobilization that was held on the 21st of September 2022. And according to the BBC, 97% of Ukrainian Federation of, I'm sorry, of the Russian Federation military were deployed to Ukraine. And in September, Russian leadership decided to hold referendums on the occupied territories to annex them to Russia. On the 6th of June 2023, uh, the, the Kohovka hydroelectric power plant was blown up, which was probably the part of the Russian military strategy aimed to create chaos and destroying infrastructure. In particular, in, particular, uh, in this case of Kohovka, uh, the researchers argue that the environmental and economic uh, consequences of destroying could be compared to the consequences of using tactic, uh, tactical nuclear weapon of five to 10 kilotons, which are not uh, contained by radiation uh, contamination. The explosion result in the evacuation of the population, this, uh, the destruction of enterprises and facilities with harmful and poisonous substances, including fluorine, ammonia, oil products, and etc. The destruction of water and electricity infrastructure, uh, the collapse of food and medical logistics, and population of the black and I'm sorry, pollution of the Black Sea ecosystem. It is also worth noting that the explosion of the Kohovka hydroelectro uh, power plant has significant consequences for the ecosystem not only uh, of the region but of the Ukraine as well. At least 150 tons of motor oil was released into uh, the Dnipro River, and there was a risk of further leaking of more than 300 tons. Thus, the explosion of Kohovka hydroelectric power station could have been aimed at causing significant damage that could affect the country's ability to effect effectively wage the war, making it impossible to conduct offensive action in this area. For some time, and focusing the attention of Ukrainian leadership and society on a new problem. The end of, two, of 2023 was quite challenging. The Ukrainian armed forces 
inflicted numerous losses on the Russians. Over the 20 days of October, Russian forces lost about 600 and 500 troops near Avdiivka, as well as 100 tanks and almost 250 units and other armored vehicles. In November, Ukraine's defense forces destroyed 2,500 uh, Russian uh, invaders and three, almost 3,000 pieces of enemy weapons and military equipment. Ukrainian military intelligence reports and cyber units hacked uh, the central server of the Russian federal tax. And all these numbers you can see on the, this slide. And we're going further. Uh, we would like to, I'm sorry. Uh, we would like to show you uh, the public information on the losses, which I switched. Uh, losses of personal and equipment, equipment in Russian Federation over uh, the 717 days of the war. This information is one of the parts of the study because depending on the losses, it is possible to establish dependence of various elements. Going to the next slide, the pro propaganda narratives are independent with hostilities and goals set by the politi political authorities. The result is illustrated on figure one. The state political objectives are constantly influenced by the outcomes of hostilities. These outcomes are determined by the number of losses in terms of both human lives, equipment, in addition to the results achieved over the specific period of time. And going further, the developed by uh, us analysis provides the chronological overview of the war goals and how military outcomes influence change of those goals. Additionally, it explores the relationship between Russia propaganda narratives and the hostilities result. And we would like to uh, Retreat our key results. First of all, political goals that directly depend on military operations were identified. Second, it has been established that failures on the contact line required changes in goals, strategies, and uh, policies. Thirdly, it is important to know that making changes to objectives or methods of achieving them will lead to corresponding changes in the dependent components. Furthermore, it should be kept in mind that certain amount of time will uh, be needed to produce the response and implement of these changes. So this is the end of our presentation. We thank you for your time and att attention. If you have any questions. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, I I don't know why, but I can't hear you. Yep, no, thank you. Oh, no, no, now I can hear you, yes. I can hear you now. So, please, the floor is open for questions now. We have some, some half an hour time for, for discussion and, and questions and answers. Please. Well, if I may start with a very simple question of, of, of we were discussing in the morning time about mm -hmm. the second wave of, or second round of the mobilization. If I calculated right your information about the losses in, in manpower, so there should be, uh, from the Russian side, there should be left somewhat 100,000 soldiers at the moment. So, and, and when we, if I recollect right, it was somewhat a bit less than 2,000 soldiers in the very beginning of the operation, so so it gives me the idea that 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 after the presidential elections there should be a, a second wave of the of mobilization in order to get some kind of change in in the, in the situation on the front. Am I thinking um, right? Uh, can I? Can yeah. Uh, 
Can, can you, when, if I remember right, there was some, somewhat a bit less than 2,000, 200,000 persons, uh, uh, soldiers, in the very beginning of the operation from the Russian side. And so the, the losses you mentioned now is almost 400,000. Uh, 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 and if we calculate together the, 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 the first phase, 200,000, plus the first wave of the mobilization, which was said that they gathered some 300,000, it makes 500,000 together. And now if they have lost somewhat 400,000, there should be left 100,000 uh, persons. And, and, and I, was, I was just wondering that, uh, that because of the internal situation in, in Russia, that means the presidential election afterwards, after that, there will be, an, or, or there must be, a second wave of, of mobilization. What do you think about this kind of? <clears throat> if, talking in, uh, if we're talking about uh, mobilization and talking about the waves, the second and the first wave. So in these terms, uh, we can say that uh, the mobilization was conducted during uh, the big period of time. It's quite hard to say, uh, when uh, the mobilization was held in Russia. And uh, you say the numbers uh, 200 at uh, the beginning. I didn't actually understand what did you mean at the beginning? Uh, were, were there losses? In February 22. In February 22. February 22, I admitted here on my slide like that there were 800 losses at the very beginning. Yeah, but the total strength of the... Ah, Russian yeah, team. yeah, I understand what you say. Uh, I think that uh, the misunderstanding was uh, that every next uh, number, uh, it, uh, it has the previous numbers in it. So uh, the losses on March 5,700 include... 800s in it and so i was adding all the time yeah that's why uh probably uh, we had this misunderstood and the last and the last numbers that we get here were provided by the great general staff uh of ukraine uh, they have these numbers uh official on their, their site website yeah so uh Yes. Other questions or comments, please. Please come forward, yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for your uh, excellent presentation. I have a question regarding the, what might be a Russian military goals for this year, for 2024? What would you say would be their main military objective for this year? And the second question is like, you assess that after the, some kind of failure, they, they, they took some time to recalibrate, and then they establish a new goals, and they, they try to achieve it. What yes. do you think? I know it's a speculation, but mm -hmm. what, what would you say in case of a change in the top leadership in Russia, let's say Putin die or whatever happened, how much time, time Russian state will need to recalibrate and accommodate the change and be ready to act again. Thank you. Yeah, uh, speaking on the first uh, question uh, about the goals uh, of Russia this year, as we clearly can see that um, I can um, come back, is that uh, the quick um, win of the war Oh, it died in 2022. So now all the all, all, all the warfare is um, focused mainly on the east of Ukraine. And as I think that he may that all the political leaderships have the uh, minimum what they have to achieve and their maximum. We see that their maximum is not achieved by them, but they will try to do their minimum, which is to occupy the uh, south and the um, east part of Ukraine. And they'll try to uh, 
make those territories Russian territories. And I think that they will try to uh, use different means uh, in order to make Ukrainians stop defending themselves uh, in order to keep those territories for Russian and so that we just, so the Ukrainians just allow them to take the territories. And talking about uh, the second part of your question, uh, which was, I'm sorry, didn't remember it. Can, could you please? President Putin, uh, something happens to him. Uh, How much time? So if something, something happens to him, it's yeah. quite a difficult question. Yeah, it's quite, it's quite a difficult question. It depends on the leadership of uh, Russian Federation. Uh, the way uh, they will finish the war, that is the main uh, point how uh, the world will uh, justify all the things that have been done by the Russian. And uh, there are many there are many ways what we can see Russia can do just to uh, cancel all the uh, sanctions that they have and get back to uh, the world. Uh, like to the world stage as everyone. So uh, this question is uh, the, the world's market. And uh, I suppose that uh, the, the way that things are happening will change rapidly because uh, I, I hope that, I think that uh, Russian, I don't hope that, I think that Russian leaders will try to do everything in order to cancel all the sanctions so they can rebuild, uh, they can rebuild new relations with the world. Thank you. Thank you. Valery, can you hear us? Yes, I'm here. I saw that you raised your hands and if you want to comment, please do. Yes, I just, um, it seems to me that <clears throat> Emma didn't get the essence of the first question about the mobilization probably probably and, if you would mm -hmm. yes and uh, i can uh, add um if, if if it's okay if this will be okay if it's appropriate to add from my side so yeah. about the mobilization the mobilization is continuing all the time for now but it's uh you know that there are different types of mobilization uh, total mobilization, hide mobilization, partial mobilization, etc. So they are providing the hide mobilization. And the problem is that um, the human resources uh, of Ukraine uh, are decreasing uh, with time. Uh, but from the other uh, other part, there is human resources uh, of Russia uh, are huge. And the while the uh, civilized uh, world is thinking to give the weapon to Ukraine or not to give, uh, we lose our people, lose our soldiers, lose our the most motivated soldiers. Uh, but again, if you speak about the total mobilization of Russia, about that, those mobilizations that their uh, uh, claims uh, to mobilize 700,000 of people, um, Maybe it can be after the elections in Russia, but um, uh, it will be. It will depends again from the people's mood, from the pub, from the uh, how how the, the population of Russia will uh, give to do to do this. Uh, but as we know, that Russia uh, have enough instrument to manage um, the problems with the population mood. <laughs> So I think that uh, if it will be necessary for Russia to make a total mobilization, but as for, as for me, it's not necessary for now because they are providing the mobilization all the time, they will do it. That is the answer for, for this question from as for me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and speaking on, yeah, thank you. And just adding about uh, what you were saying before, or the Russian mood, uh, as recent news, I was reading uh, Russian news recently, where they state that uh, almost 92% of Russians, uh, they support 
the Russian government at, at this time and only aid to no support. So we can see that at this moment, uh, propaganda is working well in Russian Federation. And if it comes to uh, mobilizing people, I think they will find uh, measures and will find ways to mobilize as much as they need in order to continue um, the war in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. And uh, could you, Emma, please stop sharing so we could see yeah, yeah, Valerie yes. also? Yeah. I'm here, so. Yep. Please. Please do, please do. This comment is related to what our uh, <clears throat> French uh, corner commented before about the similarities in one case and another. The, the perception that I have is that Russia uh, has a kind of toolbox and they are pragmatic, opportunistic, we can use different adjectives, but they adapt to the situation. Um, and speaking about change, I, I think there is also a change of perceptions in the in the European Union, especially but uh, NATO, but also the European Union, about how Russia can can exploit this uh, this situation. Uh, Russian is going to react different if they have a Russian minority in one place. If if uh, they are acting in a society that is really split, I will provide an example from my own country. In 2000. 17, there was a, a illegal uh, referendum of independence in Catalonia. Apart from misinformation, some attacks, against, uh, hacker attacks against some web page of uh, Spanish institutions, there was a, 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 a prosecutor who started an investigation on, on how Russia could be involved. And the case was closed because many people said, okay, this is like a, a spy uh, novel, you know, Russia promising soldiers money and so on, and people didn't pay attention. But a few days ago, the European Parliament has signed an, a, 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 a statement on the middling of, of Russia elements in, in some countries, and Spain has started again the investigation, you know, about how uh, Russia promised around 10,000 soldiers, money, millions in order to pay. So maybe our perception about the, how Russia is acting is also changing. You know. This uh, was my comment. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Please. Who can uh, make an answer for this question? Should they? I, actually, it's a, it was a comment only that, yeah. that also our ideas and perceptions will change during time. Yeah. Please. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Emma and Valeri for your uh, nice presentation. So uh, I was trying to think of a of a question that maybe uh, links up both of your your talks. So definitely, uh, maybe you can both weigh in on it. Um, so Valeri, you you talked about the various hybrid campaigns that Russia was uh, undertaking against uh, not only Ukraine but uh, I guess the West in, in general. Um, and then you talked about a little bit about uh, the necessary to, to defend against those. And I kind of read that, you know, initially as mostly uh, kind of reactive and how to react and, and uh, be more resilient uh, against those. And then, um, Emma, you talked about how the, the situation on the ground uh, and the losses, for example, changed the political objectives and you can kind of see results of that. So my question is, uh, you know, how does, how does Ukraine try to proactively, uh, potentially using hi their own hybrid campaigns, uh, affect the, the political objectives of, of Russia? So, um, you know, for example, the, the sinking uh, of another landing ship uh, today, uh, you see these uh, unmanned, uh, uncrewed uh, systems uh, taking out uh, Russian oil refineries uh, deep into Russia. Uh, you know, there's there's various of, of these kind of means, you know, blowing up uh, railroad tracks, etc., that are more offensive uh, type measures, but uh, you know, part of a, I guess, 
maybe you can explore, um, elaborate more on what type of hybrid campaigns uh, Ukraine can undertake to then try to uh, achieve those kind of uh, changes in the political objectives uh, and whether any um, kind of analysis is being done uh, on the, the effectiveness of that. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Yep. Uh, thank you for the for your question. <clears throat> uh, once again, I want to emphasize that it is uh, difficult to provide uh, to provide uh, country in uh, Russia without uh, the weapon again. But what uh, uh, what more we can do? Uh, of course, uh, firstly, I I know that uh, you are thinking about and uh, this question on the lips. Uh, do do does the Ukraine uh, do enough uh, for uh, by them by itself to protect itself? Uh, as as for me, not enough. We are doing not enough. We are not um, consolidate of all, all of all our efforts to to protect our people, to dis, to deter the enemy. Uh, but what what could we do? Uh, Again, it's not new. It's um, it's all in classic of uh, military strategy, and also in Clausewitz's uh, book, which was mentioned earlier, and he has a chapter in his theory of uh, war um, about the war, uh, big chap chapter which called um, "People War," which. Uh, tell us about the strategy when the, all the population uh, should be involved in protection of their land. Uh, another one is uh, asymmetric, activi asymmetric, asymmetric activities. It's um, um, uh, about the um, guerrilla mo movement and uh, all other uh, actions uh, in the uh, temporary occupied territories uh, on the, um, and, and, and etc. And uh, of course, that that uh, those actions that we can, could provide uh, with the lack of the weapon, uh, with the using of our engineering and scientific potential uh, that that we, we we have, it's not it's not uh, so big as uh, we want it. But uh, um, uh, what is what it can be? It's a cyber dimension. Uh, you you see, you saw that this phenomenon of uh, cyber resilience uh, was raised uh, again thanks to our international partners and our the cooperation between the state and pi private sectors uh, and um, so this all the elements of um, national resi resilience that we should develop develop and uh, what about them um, Catalonia, and the example of Catalonia and other countries, that um, the bright uh, example of uh, that, that uh, unfortunately, uh, the free world uh, doesn't uh, pay enough attention to its security and uh, defense, uh, informational security, um, uh, and all, all types of, of, of it. Uh, and even now, when there's the war in the center of Europe, uh, a lot of the most part of countries and uh, uh, that are members of NATO, even members of NATO, uh, give not more than two percent of their uh, economy to to the to, to, to the protection to to protect it themselves to to the security and defense sector. It is the problem. I see that. Uh, the the influence of Russia uh, is really huge, but um, the NATO is a very powerful uh, block, and uh, there are of course there are a lot of problems with the elections in different countries. Uh, but we should understand that uh, the life of people uh, and uh, their um, I'm I'm speaking about Russia now. Uh, the authorities of Russia doesn't matter about life of people, and they didn't uh, uh, give them not not a penny, not a ruble uh, that that they can take it. And so they will uh, build new uh, new weapon manufacturers, plants, and uh, they will um, 
work uh, with the uh, governments uh, with, of, of other countries. Uh, they they will uh, make all the to to provide the authorities uh, to have their power. Uh, and we know this uh, well-known triangle of, uh, of of their policy that uh, uh, war, power, and uh, and the people and the elections. Yes, so the elections uh, and the support of their authorities is laying in the dimension of the war providing and the enemy. Uh, they are surrounded by the enemy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the the only way. To, to deter Russia is to be consolidated and to combine all a force of civilian people. That is my my point, my view of that. Thank you. And Arden, yeah, sorry, yeah, uh, just uh, if I could add a few words is that uh, the main problem that we see here in Ukraine is that production of domestic weapons and military equipment is quite low and we are quite depending on uh, on other countries, allied countries. Uh, and I think that first of all, our country and, our, and each country of Europe have to think first of all about their production of military equipment in order to defend their country. And uh, as we can see, uh, as we can see, um, Russia didn't stop on uh, several countries. Uh, they also decided to invade Ukraine, but they didn't. Um, they didn't um, see that Ukrainian people would defend hard their. Um, Hardly their territory, and uh, from this they caused a lot of like problems for Russians to set their goals. And also uh, talking about the sanctions, we can also see that Russians are bypassing sanctions uh, quite easy because reading the statements uh, today, we see that. Uh, in two, 2024, Russia has already uh, reproduced uh, the amount of uh, weapons and uh, military equipment, uh, the number that was counted uh, approximately in 2022 when the invasion uh, just began. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the presentations. Um, uh, Pane Hordichuk, we met uh, in autumn uh, in Oslo. Uh, I have a question. Well, I know the answer, but I think it will be important for the audience to hear a bit more from you on the following question and the following topic. In the Nordics in these days, in the NATO discussions, there is the concept of um, total defense or comprehensive defense. And obviously, Nordic countries have their answers to the uh, total defense and their traditions with the comprehensive defense. Can you comment a little bit about the role of the Ukrainian society in this civil military cooperations towards building the comprehensive defense in Ukraine? At least your perspectives, because it's one of the topics that is being discussed, and I think it would be relevant to hear uh, for the audience to hear your perspective on this matter. Thank you very much, and once again, pleasure to see you. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, could I uh, answer? So a few points about this. Uh, uh, just some historical milestones that uh, with, the, with the support of our uh, NATO partners in the 2016, uh, we changed our uh, military and strategic uh, uh, policy and the strategy of national security uh, from the um, nation uh, from the military organization uh, of state to the uh, organization of uh, um, security and defense sector as you remember about this uh, 
it's a uh, it's it's a common approach uh, to make to to build uh, and it it was called total defense strategy. Yes, our new new uh, security national uh, defense strategy called total defense strategy, and uh, it's it's a uh, work for this moment. Uh, but if it's if it's appropriate to Ukraine to use this uh, strategy, total defense strategy, uh, for example, for now. For example, as for me, um, it's not appropriate to use all the approaches which are using uh, in 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 West. Why? Uh, because, for example, NATO countries, NATO and USA, build their strategy on uh, on the base of uh, capabilities. Uh, why? Because they do not know who will who, what problem they will man manage next uh, next day. What who will be the enemy? For next day, but we know who are who is our enemy. We know that the Russia is our enemy. We we shouldn't uh, um, build uh, uh, total defense, total defense, and uh, from from all the sides, from all the sides of Ukraine. We know that that side, uh, that is the, where is our enemy situated, and from from where we will be have some more problems, and etc. Et so. Uh, what is the role? This is about the role and place of the strategy of total de defense uh, and uh, comprehensive defense. So as for me, it should be reviewed and um, should be changed because we have exact enemy and we know uh, his uh, capabilities. We know the uh, exact their tools, their instruments and uh, Yes, we should pay attention uh, on the another uh, problem uh, ways from uh, uh, PMR, for example, Moldova uh, and uh, Hungary, Romania, Belarus. But the most problem is uh, for us is Russia, and we, we it's it, it's my point of view, and we should build our strategy on this uh, on this approach. And what about civil military cooperation? Uh, Again, uh, the military organization state of the state, which was uh, before the 2016, uh, the, the aim of it was to consolidate all the society, all the uh, measures that can provide Ukraine to deter uh, aggression. And now we have only the sector uh, or security and defense sector, which con which uh, conclude uh, content with the consist with the four parts. It's a uh, security uh, part, defense part, uh, then industrial um, industrial part, and uh, uh, society and uh, civilian people who are involved in protection of Ukraine. Uh, where is, for example, in other ministers, uh, for example, uh, uh, of ec economy, it's not involved in the protection of Ukraine. It's all, all, all of them are responsible for uh, peace life, but we have war now, and what to do with this? We need we need to consolidate all the people, all the population, all the efforts in all the branches, in all the spheres, because uh, the enemy is very powerful, as I mentioned earlier. That is my point of this, because not all strategies of NATO, not all strategies of blocks, can be can be uh, appropriate for each of the of, of, of member of these blocks and each of countries but it's again it's only my uh, point of view thank you yeah. <clears throat> is there any questions left if i may for i, I think we have a few minutes left the, a short question about the about the management of, of, of the so-called en enemy acting, uh, uh, making these different processes and, and actions towards Ukraine. Could you, both of you, a bit elaborate about the management? Who is, and what way is, is the, 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 the activities are orchestrated in time, in space, in organization, and especially for, for Emma is, is that the uh, 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 the, the changing objectives 
whether they are political or, mi or military, does any other actor has an influence on, on this process, making decisions about the objectives or, or actions? And, and please, you, you can, for, for the final words or, or saying remarks, you, you can comment on, on the other's uh, uh, presentation or, or ideas if you, will, if you like. Is it a question for, for, for us, to us? Um, yeah, yeah, for both, if you yeah. would like to, to elaborate about the management or, or the leadership of the... Oh, the Emma, activity. please. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's more relevant to uh, my presentation. So first of all, I would say she, I would say that political goals they uh, directly depend on the uh, po politics and uh, the military operations, uh, and um, <clears throat> and we can say that if we uh, see failures. Uh, the contact, uh, the contact line. It will uh, straight away uh, make the politicians change uh, the goals and strategy in order to uh, to uh, to to achieve the main goal. What was uh, what what they had at the very beginning, like the very first goal. And thirdly, that uh, is important. I'd like to admit is that um changes of goals and method methodologies of achieving them uh will always depend on uh, the components and uh, uh the procedures of implementing new ways of achieving goals uh, both the political and military goals thank you thank you Valerie, would you like to? Yes. It's a, um, thank you for your question. It's a really uh, difficult question, which we need to solve. Uh, and it, it is, unfortunately, we cannot solve this uh, even after two years of war now in Ukraine. Uh, so the, the problem is who should... Um, um, who, who should be in charge for the uh, for the resilience uh, for the orchestrating as you said uh, all these efforts and um, now uh, in ukraine we have uh, according to our strategic documents of uh, special period and war period uh, the orchestrating of such efforts and coordinating uh, uh, between the different institutions in, in, in ministries um, should uh, make a um, uh, security council, security council of Ukraine is the, the first body who is uh, responsible for 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 this coordination, and the second one I I will try to to make a, a, a translation. Uh, Um, the supreme uh, the, the the position uh, of the supreme commander in chief. I don't know Stavka Emma. Maybe you will help me. How как перевести Стavka верховного военного командующего? Yes. I'll just have a yeah. It's like a body, state body, which is established uh, during the war beginning. Uh, which is consists from uh, the uh, first uh, uh, persons of uh, security and defense sector services. And also there is the uh, Ministry of Infrastructure, Ministry of Informational Politics, Policy, Ministry of Economy, and etc. So, but if you speak about the efficiency of those body, I, do, I cannot evaluate it from my, my, my side. Yes, for me, it's not enough, but... Thank you for that. Thank, thank you. I, I, I think. Yeah, I, I think we give applause to to Emma and Valerie for the for the presentations and discussions. Yeah, I, I think so. Our time is up. For
for, for this session and, and we'll continue downstairs in the, in the main hall and, and, and the next technology. And, and all the best to you, Valeria and Emma, and Slava Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have, a, have a fruitful and nice cooperation. Thank you. Thank you.